Well, good Monday evening, everyone. Welcome to Bowling with the FEF, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story. We discuss issues in the sport, ask and answer questions, and it's all live on the YouTube channel that you're watching right now. If uh, you're interested in being on the show, uh, let me know. Bowling with the FEF at yahoo.com is the email address. And uh, we do have a public Facebook group that uh, is almost 200 strong now at Bowling with the FEF. So uh, join us, uh, discuss uh, what you love about bowling. And uh, like I said, if you're interested in being on the show, we are always looking for guests on future episodes. And if you've been watching, uh, you know that we are kind of in a series here. Uh, where we are kind of getting into the PBA, or PWBA Twin Cities Open, which is coming up a little later this month, April 22nd through 24th at Cedarvale Lanes in Egan, Minnesota. Uh, through a partnership with Cedarvale and owner Brent Prentice, we have some exciting guests coming on the show uh, in recent weeks, uh, including last week, where you saw Tanil Milligan, the Director of Operations in the PWBA, and this week, we have another very exciting guest. I'm pleased to announce Deandra Asbady of Chicago, Illinois, here with us to share her bowling story. Deandra, how are you doing today? Hello, I'm doing amazing. Thanks for having me here. I'm hey, so excited to do this. Thanks for being here. I, I got to start this out because normally we'd have Brent here. He had a prior commitment, something came up and he wasn't able to join us, but I assured him we'd you know, steer the ship and, uh, and get through this. But uh, when did you meet Brent? How, I, I guess, do, it was, do you remember meeting him? No, we were, I think, I feel like we were like in youth bowling times. I okay. actually don't remember. Um, I, he's just always kind of been like a figure in my, in, in my past and, and a good figure, a good positive uh, figure and, and bowling needs that, right? He's just such a, a bright light in our sport. So it's an honor for me to uh, call him my friend, but I really can't remember. I wonder if he can. Did he, you ask him? He might. I, I haven't asked him specifically, but you know, I love doing these shows, uh, you know, surrounding the tournament because it gives me a chance to bring out some old pictures of him. And, oh. you know, especially since he's not on tonight, what better, you know, what better time, you know, to, to <laughs> dig through the archives. So, what I did was I remembered back in either 1995 or 1996, there was a tournament at uh, the former Red Carpet West Alice where you bowled 16 games of qualifying to get to Sunday where there were 12 more and then a step ladder and all that stuff. I so remember. You remember. Um, I think that all three of us were in the same building for one of those two. I want to say maybe 96. So let me give you some backstory. I'm from Milwaukee originally, and I moved to Minnesota And when I was 10, stayed there till I graduated high school, and then moved back. So, of course, this is the height of my junior bowling and Brent's junior bowling. So when we found out about this tournament, he decided to come down with, with another friend and bowl the tournament. So I don't have a picture from that tournament, so I kind of made one. Um <laughs> You know, this, oh, right. wow. this is, why, why is he so scared? He's, I mean, he's scared. He, he's very scared. And I, I'm kind of scared too, because, you know, you're obviously the champion there. I, and this is, you know, this is, I took many liberties, you know, creating this photo. <laughs> I, I love it. It is amazing. It, it is, <laughs> nobody's ever done this for me. Let, before, let me explain. So. so this is, uh, this is the picture uh, that I determined through, you know, just a, a, an educated guess. This was the the most distant photo that you presented to me. Uh -huh. And then Brent is here around that time. That's one of the only pictures I had of him. Um, and, and that's I'm, the one. You yeah. have one picture, and that's the one. <laughs> Other than high school yearbook, which we're going to bring out, you know, in, eight, in later shows. Um, Amazing. But and this is me from around that time. Uh, the bowling center is not Red Carpet West Dallas. It's Red nope. Carpet Regency. But, uh, you know, it's just something I decided to, you know, kind of slap together. Wow. What an amazing surprise. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a little bit scared that he's so scared in the picture. And you're just, you're, you're like looking at me in admiration and pride. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, I remember that tournament, and I remember you and Cassie being there. Oh, and, awesome. And hearing that you two were just tearing up, you know, junior competition. And that's really the earliest memory I have of uh, of you and your bowling. Uh, what do you remember about uh, about that tournament? Oh my gosh, I just remembered it was like a marathon. And I remember getting in my big white van and driving up, you know, out of state. We're from Indiana. So it was like a big deal to go uh, through a couple states to get there. And um, I loved bowling it every, um, every year. Is that the place that had the ball returns that go to the to the yep. foul line. Yep, it is. <laughs> yeah, so I remember that, and I haven't been there since then. So that is definitely something that stands out. It was so hard because I kicked the ball return yep. every shot <laughs> unintentionally. Many of us did, especially yes. on ten pins. Yes, yeah, it was such a great <laughs> tournament, though, and it's those tournaments that really inspired me to go on to create my Elite Youth Tour. Because I just, I remember the joy that it brought me. I remember that it was difficult. I remember it was a grind. I remember the friends that I met along the way. So it was just, um, I have fond memories. Yeah. And that elite youth tour has brought about some real great competitors in the sport. Um, you know, at this time, I can't help but mention Cameron Crow, who has a history in that tour and finished 49th. In the in the USBC Masters this last week, that must yeah. have made you ecstatic. I mean, I, yes, I feel like a lot of these kids' mom, like Jillian Martin, who's bowling in the U.S. Open right now, um, and Cameron, like he sent me a message right, I think, before his practice session in the Masters, and he he said, "Do you think it's it would be okay with you?" when I make the TV show to wear an elite youth tour Jersey and my heart melted. I'm <laughs> like, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's okay. Like I, I'm so proud of these youth bowlers and that is why I built this thing. It, it's to prepare them for these moments that I knew that they were going to run into in their future and to get them ready. So they don't show up and, feel surprised like oh these are really hard lanes i'm not used to this i know it's hard and it's a grind when when kids are coming every month but i always tell them you might be frustrated with me now but you'll thank me later that you know the opportunities that i'm giving you through hard lane patterns um they're setting you up to succeed and although you know it's hard to see in the moment uh, it's proof when you look at someone like cameron crow that man, he he came up to me three months before he bowled the team trials, um, the last time that they held it, and he said, "Do you think that I'm good enough to make the junior team?" And I said, "I do, but you need to believe that you're good enough to make the junior team." Uh, and then he made the adult team, <laughs> and he he won the national amateur champion at the same age that I think I won it, which was really kind of special. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm so proud of, of what I'm doing, but also what, um, what we've created in the elite youth tour, because, you know, Jillian Martin bowling against pros, like I'm kind of glad that I didn't bowl in January, those PWBA stops, because <laughs> I'm not looking forward to bowling her at all on the lanes and, right. She was um, she was really sweet. We just had our very first youth adult event at the Elite Youth Tour, and she messaged me and she's like, "Can um, can pros bowl?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." I never said that pros couldn't bowl. So then she's like, "Well, will you bowl with me?" And I was like, <gasps> uh, "Well, I have to run the tournament, yeah. um, and also I didn't say this, but also that's intimidating. Like I don't want to <laughs> let her down. She'd be counting on me, but." Uh, her and her family are just amazing people. We had a little celebration for her at my last event. I got a bunch of cupcakes and um, we just, we celebrated her because she should be celebrated. What she's doing right now has never been done in the history of bowling, having a youth bowler, just like Spencer Robarge, making the show at the masters. Like who, 
what these kids are so 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 good and i'm just i'm proud that i can sit back and, and watch them move mountains yeah and having a, a piece of some of that with that elite youth tour yeah. has got to be awesome too um i was going to try and go into this and and try to describe what you are pwba member junior tour director motivational speaker coach visionary i i, I wasn't even gonna you know try because mom. i can't. mom which is most important, <laughs> most important. I, I can't you know figuratively get my arms around all that <laughs> but uh it, what's it like to you know to be in all those places at different times and all those mindsets in different times chaotic <laughs> it's amazing right to be right. able to kind of um write your own story and um, do what moves you and what you truly love. I'm so grateful and I'm so fortunate that I can do that. Um, but also it's sometimes overwhelming because I'm the type of person that's like, I'll just get so many ideas and I'm just like, I'm just gonna do them all, I'm gonna do them all. And then all of a sudden I have nothing in my tank. And so it's, it's hard um, because I'm always, doing something. Um, it's rewarding because I'm always doing something that I like to think is serving other people because that is, is my purpose. Um, it's exciting because I love coming up with new ideas and doing things that hasn't been done before. Um, it's a lot of things, you know, and, um, you know, my biggest goal in life was, is truly to be, was to be a mom. And so to be, um, such a, you know, a big force in my kid's life is something that above anything matters most. Um, but, you know, I, I like to think that I'm creating things that maybe might live forever. And that's the goal. Yeah. No, that's incredible and <laughs> admirable. Um, you. you know, all, all of that. Although sometimes then people you know, they'll, they'll, you know, like you, you know, you know that I do all these things, but yet they'll be like, so what do you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, cause you know, I'm not going to an office. I'm, yeah. I'm um, creating my own schedule. I'm giving a lot of lessons. I'm doing clinics and creating digital products and competing. And, but yet it's confusing to a lot of people. And they're just like, so like, take me through your day to day. <laughs> and I'm like, every day is so different, which yeah. is great. Cause I don't like monotonous things. Sure. And I, obviously you, you are not in that, uh, yeah. that type of situation. So let's, uh, I guess, make it easy for people to understand by going back to where it all began to Dyer, Indiana and how your bowling story started. And we can't, describe this without bringing up and giving some credit to Grandma Betty. So how does it all start for you in bowling? Well, um, my grandma Betty bowled in a league on Wednesday nights and um, she had this blue locker, viv very vivid memories of like the blue locker with her purple ball that said Betty. And when you opened her locker, there was a picture of Earl Anthony and like, cause he was, he was it for her. So I, you know, my sister and I would just go watch her bowl and it was fun. I was really young. I was five. And then she bought us our first bowling ball. I was five. My sister was eight and a half. And I, um, I remember bowling with Cassie going to practice. My dad would always take us. It was just fun. And then, um, Cassie was noticed at the bowling center by our childhood coach, Dick Tucker. And um, he showed interest in coaching her. And so my dad was like, okay, great. Cause he was coaching other people and he had, um, you know, some, a lot of credibility. And so Cassie started practicing more often with um, Mr. T we would call him. And I was just kind of there for the ride. I was just kind of like hanging out, throw a couple shots, take a break, play some games. I, I would always go to the pay phones and see if there was quarters left, you know, what kids do. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, Cassie started winning things. And I was like, 
okay, well, I want to win things. So, and then I was like, oh, I see what's happening. So she's practicing more and actually more serious about it. And I'm just having fun. Maybe, maybe I should approach it more like Cassie is. And so then I did. And so I started bowling when I was five, but when I was about 12, I was like, okay, I truly believe that I can be one of the best bowlers in the world. And coming from Dyer, Indiana, very small town, you know, people would look at me like, who do you think you are that you think that you could be the best in the world at anything? And, and when but, they said, who do you think you are? You said, I am. I right? am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see, I was, I had that before. Pete right. Did. Yeah. yeah. I didn't get any credit for it. So <laughs> I, you know, I just, I, I was like crazy enough to actually believe that I could. And because nobody ever told me that I couldn't. And so if you live a life where anything is possible, then you think anything is possible. And so I remember thinking, I truly want to be one of the best bowlers in the world. And um, I started getting more serious about it, practicing more. Mr. T was coaching me. Cassie was continuing to win. And my inspiration, I wanted to win all the things that she was winning. Um, and she, you know, I was just following in her footsteps so much so that nobody really even knew my name when I was a kid. I was Cassie's little sister. Do, do you remember when I was Cassie's little sister? I just remember the two of you. Okay. And when, you know, when I'm I'm thinking about this, you know, I've got to kind of get some perspective. So I asked Cassie, I said, you know, what was it like, you know, when starting out? And she told me that we had a vision early on and we chased that vision. Oh. And that was pretty powerful to me because it, it was kind of bigger than just, well, we you know, we're in the bowling center and trying to get as good as we can. We yeah. had a vision. I mean, yeah, that's, I think... a, that's powerful. And I would totally agree. And we had, fortunately, we had parents that gave us those opportunities because without them, we wouldn't be practicing every night. Like we practiced every night in middle school and high school from 930 at night because you had to wait till the leagues were over and oh, the right. smoky bowling center where it, there was a haze along uh, among the lanes. Yeah. And we just couldn't wait for the bowlers, the league bowlers to like get out, get their stuff packed up and leave so we can jump on the lanes. And we would practice till midnight or one o'clock in the morning, which is super crazy. Cause as a mom now, I'm just like, what, Where, why did you let us do that? <laughs> yeah. But it, it was, my dad got home late from work. And so that was really the only chance we had. And we learned at a young age, you get out what you put in. And my dad was willing to come like, you know, we had it all down. I came home from school. My mom made me take a nap if we were going to be out late. So I would have to lay down for two hours, make sure all my homework was done. We'd go practice 930 to midnight every night. And um, sometimes we'd go to breakfast after <laughs> like what? But we had to keep our grades up and we were good in school. So we were um, allowed this opportunity, but without my parents, and, and I see all the parents at my elite youth tour too. And I always thank them every month because without them, the, these kids don't get to have those opportunities. So I thank them very much for, for showing us that it was possible and not, you know, it's funny because ever since my son Madden, who's almost 11, he'll be 11 this summer. Uh, ever since he was little, he said, I, um, what do you want to be? Like when I would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And ever since he was like little, little, he wanted to be a professional baseball player. And in his mind, there's no question that he's going to do it. And I thought that was really interesting because it's so hard, right? It's so yeah. hard to become a professional bowler, even harder to become yeah. a professional baseball player. But he is living in a house here that is like how I lived growing up. Like, if that's what you want to do, you should go and do that. But it doesn't just happen, you know? And so he saw that I lived my dream and I became one of the best in the world in my twenties, three times. I was the world bowler of the year. That dream came true. And he knows that that came true for me. So he thinks like, why not me too? And he knows how hard I worked. He knows the story of when I was a kid. And so I think that's really empowering to, to teach kids that they're in control 
of their destiny. Like they get to choose how good they want to be in anything in bowling in school and work and baseball and whatever it's, it's on you, but you get out what you put in. And so if you are okay with being mediocre, be mediocre. But if you truly want to be one of the best, you can do that. You surround yourself with the right people. Here's my secret sauce. Surround yourself with the right people. Work harder than anyone else. Get up when you fall down. Believe in it. And find the resources that you need to make it happen. The coaching. There's so many great um, places you can go that have um, the training centers that, that you can go and get better. And you can, you know, bowlers in general, professional bowlers are pretty accessible, which is really great that, you know, these kids can kind of, they can see us at a tournament and, and they'll approach us and feel like they can. And in a lot of other sports, it's not that way. Right. Yeah. So it makes it possible for me to do a show like this, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and that's interesting that you say that because, you know, I know as parents, we, you know, sometimes have it in our mind that there's a way to do things and we know better, but, uh, you know, that's awesome to, you know, to teach your kids, Hey, I had a dream. Here's how I did it. You can do it too. And, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, your children appreciate that. I'm sure your bowlers in the elite youth tour appreciate that too. Um, at some point, you know, you said when you were 12, you kind of thought, Hmm. I might have something here, but at some point you must have thought, you know what? I'm good enough to go to college and compete for a university. What point was that? And why did you choose Nebraska? Yeah. So when I was in high school, um, there was all this talk about college bowling and my sister, of course, being three and a half years older, she was going to hit it first. And so she goes to this powerhouse, Wichita state and, they had won so many national titles. Everybody knew their name in college bowling. Gordon Fatican was the coach. And it was the place to go if you wanted to become an even better bowler and win national titles. So she decided that she was going to go there. And I know, it, I feel like it was my freshman year of high school. We were, we were writing an essay on our future in college and all of that. And I remember saying, I'm going to Wichita too. My sister's going there and that's where I'm going to go. Cause I do all the things that she does and <laughs> I follow her everywhere. Well, throughout high school, um, it was, it was getting a little frustrating that people didn't know my name and, and it was always Cassie's little sister. And so I thought, you know, get it going in a junior and senior year. I'm like, well, I can go and bowl with Cassie for a year, which would be amazing. And maybe we could win a national championship together, which would be a dream. Or I could become Deandra. And that was a really hard decision for me because although I, I loved their team and their coaching and I knew I'd be a good bowler, I kind of thought it was my opportunity to break out and not follow in those footsteps. Um, so I remember approaching the Nebraska coach, uh, it was Bill Straub, at one of her collegiate events. And I went up to him and I said, yeah, hi, I'd like to just inquire about some information on Nebraska. And he's like, really? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I haven't made up my mind and I'm keeping all the options open. And that was the first year they were going to be NCAA for bowling. Uh, and so that was significant too. So I was like, oh, wait, so I get all the things that the football players at Nebraska would get like their per diem and where they eat and where they work out and the, the facilities, like we're going to be treated like athletes. Wow. That's pretty different, you know, cause bowling is always, kind of gone under the radar, as you know. And so I was like, I really like the idea of being treated as an athlete. The team was super welcoming. And um, I, as soon as I made my visit to the University of Nebraska to look at the campus, I just fell in love with it. I'm like, I feel like I'm supposed to be a Husker and not a shocker. And so um, best decision that I made, right? Because it was very... Um, it was very symbolic because my first national championship that we bowled for Nebraska was in Wichita. Wow. And we won. Yeah. And there's this picture out there of Cassie and I hugging on the approach after we won. 
she ran out. Um, they didn't make the finals. They weren't in the championship with us, but she came out to the approach and she hugged me. And so she's got her Wichita state colors on and I've got my Nebraska shirt on. And like, I get chills talking about it because like that was the moment I became Deandra yeah. because I had done something that she hadn't done yet. And there weren't many things that she didn't do. And so that was really significant. And then we ended up winning another one. Um, I was the, the bowler of the year, player of the year one year. Um, and then I was able to win the student athlete of the year at the University of Nebraska. That's all sports. Wow. And that has always held a lot of weight in my career because that's beyond bowling, right? That's like right. volleyball. That, Nebraska is so strong in so many sports. And so for, for a bowler to win it for the first time, and I think no bowler has won it since was significant. And it also was significant because it wasn't just because I was a good bowler. It also was because of my community service and what I was doing to give back. And, you know, my, I was on team USA. So my travels around the world and I bowled the world cup. And so, um, I don't even remember what your question was, but I think that I answered it. <laughs> I think you did. You okay. absolutely did. Okay. Um, you know, and as we get into that Team USA kind of portion of your bowling story, it, it kind of meshes with the college because when you get to college, you've probably bowled a lot of individual stuff, but in college, it's mostly team. And Team USA, obviously, is mostly team. You had uh, the opportunity in 99 and 2000 to bowl with your sister. And she said she was thrilled to be standing alongside you on those Team USA teams. How, you know, how were you as a team bowler? And did you have to change anything in either physically or mentally to get into the best team mindset that you could? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it feels a little bit like a loaded question because um, I, m my personality is very, um, very much like I, I want harmony. Mm -hmm. I want people to get along. I just, I, I, um, I always loved bowling on a team because I thought if we win, we all win, which is awesome. And when you win by yourself, like who cares? No one cares. Nobody, your parents care, like, you know, your family cares. But when you win as a team, there's so many more people that share in that joy. And that is one thing that I really loved about Team USA, about University of Nebraska and collegiate bowling is that, um, I never felt alone out there. It was, it was a team effort. We were in it together. Um, and I mean, if, if I'm being honest, it was not all easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, bowling on a team with a lot of different personalities, it's not going to be easy. Right. And so, and, and everybody also is coming from their area. They're the best in their area. And this, so they come together and, um, you know, it's, there is a little bit of a struggle there that, um, happens. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Right. So there were moments that were hard for me and, um, I struggled through, but I just, I, I want to put that out there because I know that there's a lot of bowlers on teams right now, whether it's collegiate high school team USA that might be going through some hard times with teammates. And I don't want it to seem like it's all going to be easy. Right. I think that the bottom line is there has to be just um, a, an amount of respect for each other. And um, you don't have to lose your competitive edge if you're rooting for someone else. And so um, I loved bowling on a team. I, I loved um, sharing the love of the sport with others that loved it as much as me. And um, I felt, I feel so grateful for the teammates that I had because I didn't just bowl with them and win with them, but I learned from them. And if you can be open minded enough to bowl on a team and learn from your teammates, it, they're just going to make you better. So, um, yeah, I had some really, I had some really fun moments in college, and um, 
you know, some of my teammates became bridesmaids in my wedding and um, we still keep in touch. And, um, you know, Team USA, to be able to beat the world with with a group of women that are amazing. Um, I thought it was really cool when my idols growing up became my teammates. That was a really significant point in my career because I grew up watching Carolyn Doran Ballard and I wanted to be Leanne Barrett and I wanted to be Kim Terrell. And I was like, wow, if I get to choose how I bowl, I want to throw it like them. Like they're so good. And I remember feeling that as a, as a young girl. And then there I was sharing a stage with them on the same team. And so that moment when you, your idols become your teammates, that's pretty powerful. And that, that shows that like you, you did go down the right path that led you to that moment. Sure. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And you know, another one of your teammates, our guest last week, Tanil Milligan said at the end of the show that she was very fortunate to call you a teammate for a few years for team USA. She said, we battled together. We went to the Pan American games together and we won a gold medal together. What's that like to, you know, when everything comes together and, all of a sudden, you're the you're the winner. You're the medalist, and you have you know this combined effort with some of the best in the world uh, to credit to that. Yeah, you know, I think that in the moment um, that Rio de Janeiro, the Pan American Games, being it, the closest thing we have to the Olympics, was so special to me, and to be able to bowl with her, um, with her history and her, you know, she she got an opportunity to bowl on tour, and I didn't, and so to be able to bowl next to somebody that had that experience was really special to me. Um, and I think that in that moment, when you win those big events, whether it's the world championships or the Pan American games, you don't really, you're so close to it. You don't really see it and you feel it. You, you feel pride and you wanted that. That was why you went there to be able to, um, to win together. But I feel like it's not until later in your career that you can look back and be like, wow, in the whole world, we won yeah. together. We did it. And we were we were better than anybody in the whole world. Like it's it's it feels bigger when you reflect back on it than when you're doing it cuz you're so close to the goal that you don't see it. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Especially if you're focused on you know that that's relatively small thing maybe you don't yeah. focus on the big picture mm -hmm. exactly you know, for, for fear of getting distracted yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that was a special event though yeah absolutely you mentioned that you didn't uh get the chance to bowl on tour so coming out of nebraska and realizing that uh, you know and, and i don't know at you know in 03 what the the thought was is this going to is the tour going to be ceased for six months for a year for two years uh, of course as, as we now know it ended up being 12 but uh, you know what was that like to you know to be kind of heading toward the pwba but then the pwba not being there for you when you were ready for it those are my 12 prime years yeah <laughs> i um graduated from nebraska uh, from nebraska and that was a big year for me. It was 2003, like you said, and I also bowled a world championship and I, um, I did really well at the world championships. Um, and then I got married. And so that year was like extraordinary. Um, but I remember after I graduated, I was like, all right, I'm going to go on tour. This is what I, my life has been leading up to. I graduated. I did well in college, academically and athletically. My next step bring it on. It's going to be the pros. Like I'm going to be a pro. Yeah. And then it was gone. And I was like, wait, what, what, what do I do? What is next then? Um, at, and in that moment, I don't know if you remember or not, but if you were bowling on team USA, you could not bowl on the pro tour. Yeah, you had to pick, you could bowl that. like as a guest, as an amateur, but I was going to have to decide, do I want to bowl on team USA or do I want to bowl on tour? And when it was pulled, you know, beneath me and I, there was no option to bowl on tour, 
I really just committed my whole entire life to Team USA for 15 years. I gave it everything that I had. I traveled around the world and bold in the most amazing places and met the most amazing people, bold with the most amazing people. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do that if there was a pro tour. And so some people are like, man, you really got cheated. You would have all these titles, right? And it's, it is, it is interesting to me when you go to the PWBA website and they did give me that one USBC Queens title, which they didn't initially cause there was no PWBA, but they, um, they gave me that as a title, which was nice of them. But how many titles would I've had because I won titles yeah. in that time that were PBA women's series titles mm -hmm. and, um, they don't count as PWBA titles. And, and my answer is, it doesn't matter to me that I don't have more PWBA titles. I have titles that are very significant to me. I, I don't really care about stats, right? I, it's not important to me. What is important to me is that I was able to represent our country and, and I did it well. And I did it with integrity and I did it with grace. And I hope that I showed those that came after me um, something that they can take from my experiences. And so I don't feel regret and I'm not upset that there was no PWB. It's unfortunate, but I think about my, my 20s and how much I did in all of the places that I traveled and the, the medals that I won and um, the experiences that I had and the people that I met. And I don't think that would have happened if I bowled a national tour. And so for that reason, I'm really happy with how things turned out. Yeah. you. I think you had mentioned this, but you were the U.S. amateur champion in 99 and again in 06. What was that like? I mean, was it, you know, was it sweeter the second time? Was it sweeter the first time? Uh, what, you know, what, what is it like for a person to win those kinds of, of titles? I mean, they're just all, they're all just always so different and they're so separate for me. In 99, um, I, I was just coming off of being on Team USA for the first year ever. And um, there were some people that didn't believe that I should be on the team early on in my Team USA career because I was so young and I didn't have a lot of experience. And the, the first year that I made Team USA, I was chosen by Palmer Falgren to be on that team. And I think a lot of people were like, why? You know, what, um, why, you know, she was a good college bowler, but is she good enough to bowl on Team USA? And that hurt. Right. I mean, that um, that is not something that I talk about a lot, but yeah. it's real. And my my early years, um, I think there was a lot of doubt in me. And am I as good as people were saying that I was? And did I deserve to be there? And that's hard to compete with that weight on your shoulders. And so then when I go the next year and I win and not only did I win in ninety nine, I beat the men. Total pins. Oh at the, the stadium. And I was just telling that story to, to my son the other day that, you know, we were watching the masters at the stadium um, on bull TV. And I said, you know, in this, I have such fond memories in the stadium. And like one year I won the national amateur championship beating and I beat the men. And um, that one meant a lot to me because um, I had a lot of weight on my shoulders and I was trying to figure out where I belonged. And after I won, I knew that I belonged there and I didn't have to, to doubt myself anymore because it's hard when, when you do reach towards the top, um, there's doubt that creeps in. There's other people that want to bring you down and, um, to be able to overcome that was a hard, but meant everything to me and to, to show everyone that I do belong here and I, I proved myself and, um, and I have a lot to contribute to this team and I want to contribute it. Um, so that was special in 2006. I feel like in my, in my mid twenties, there was when I was 
a lot more seasoned. Like in 99, I still had so much to learn. I mean, I remember bowling the world championships. My first international tournament ever was in 99 in Abu Dhabi. And the thing that I learned at that event was that I had a lot to learn. You know, I remember I have very vivid memories of watching Kelly Kulik win the singles event and get the gold medal put around her neck. And I remember looking up at her when she was on the podium thinking, wow, I want to feel what that feels like. I want to know what it's like to be the best in the world. And she was very inspiring to me. Um, a lot of my teammates were. So that was early on. But when I, in 2006, when I won the National Amateur Championship, or National Amateur Championship, I... I knew where I belonged in 99. I was trying to prove that I belonged in 2006. I knew with all of the experience that I was gaining and all the knowledge from the coaches on team USA, from my teammates and the, my work ethic, I knew that um, that was special because I knew that I had nothing to prove anymore. Right. And that's a nice feeling that you can go in and you're just lighter and you're just like, yeah, I've already done all the work. I've already proven myself. I don't have to prove myself anymore. And that's sort of like how I feel competing these days. I don't feel like I need to show anybody anything. Like I've, I did it and I did it well. I, I believe I can still win. I know it's a lot harder now because I have a lot more on my plate. I, I'm not in denial, but I do believe that with my experience, with my mental game, with my, my bowling balls and my storm ball reps, I feel like I could still win and that's why I still compete, but I'm not doing it full time. And I totally understand that these girls out there are, and that's why it's really hard because they're dedicating their whole life to the sport. Like I did when I was their age, I remember what that was like being Diana and Daria and Verity and like Danielle and thinking like, all I want to do is bowl and win and, and, and travel. And I, I, I just, I remember that feeling. That's why I was really sad for them last year when there couldn't be a tour because of COVID. Um, cause I knew how much that must've hurt them. You know, like I wanted to compete, but it's not my whole entire life anymore, but it is for them. And so, um, although it's harder, I'm still coming for them. <laughs> And that's great. <laughs> we're we're glad you are. Uh, there was a tournament in uh, 2010, a mixed doubles tournament, where you ended up teaming up with Brian Voss. How did that come to be? That wasn't something where you and Brian decided we're going to bowl together, right? That was mm -hmm. part of the competition that you were paired up. Yeah. So we were bowling in Colorado and it was, um, yeah, this mixed doubles event. They never really, I don't think they had an event like this. It was like the PBA and the, and the women's series PBA coming together. And um, I didn't cho choose Brian, but I would have. I'm like, you know, sure. to be able to bowl with a Hall of Famer, I'm like, whoa, you know, he's, he's just one of the best ever. And when we qualified in the same position, I don't even know what position it was, but it was the same. And so then we were matched up and I was honored to bowl with Brian Voss. Um, I don't know how he felt, but we got along really well. We had a really great um, just chemistry bowling and we had a lot of faith in each other. I learned a lot from him in that event. And, um, I have vivid memories of, you know, Jason and Michelle Feldman bowling together and just crushing the field. They were 500 pins above second place and they just were like in another bowling center, bowling a different tournament. And I, um, Brian and I were getting close to the, to the end and we were in the hunt to make the show. And this the last game, the position round, it could have gone a lot of different ways. There was a lot of bowlers that were close. And um, I remember thinking, okay, we need to just put together a good game. I felt like I had a good look. 
And um, you can pull this this video up on YouTube. It's really kind of cool. But um, do you know what I'm going to talk about? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I was going to say, you know, after you're done with your part of this, you said you don't know how he feels about it. Well, oh. I do. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I do. And I'm going to tell you about it after uh, you're done. But go I ahead. I can't wait. I can't wait. So we, um, we're bowling our position round. And I put some strikes together. He was putting some strikes together. And then it was like the eighth frame. And he pocket seven ten, and where I was like, oh man, it like that w that was the frame that was like going to set us up for the um, the ninth and the the tenth, and it was really close. And I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, we're not going to make the show. And then he made it, and um, not only did he make it, but we made the show, and then we were interviewed by. Um, Rob and Randy Rob and, they, and, and Randy Peterson. Yeah, yeah. And, and Randy said, Brian, we watched this position round and in the eighth frame, you left the pocket seven and 10 in a really important frame. What were you thinking? And he's like, that I was, I was thinking what I think every time I leave anything I need to pick up that I'm going to make it. And I was like, <laughs> wait, what? Maybe that's why I've never gotten the 710. <laughs> and wait, what? I I was like, no wonder he's so good and he's in the Hall of Fame because he doesn't doubt himself. He's just like, I left that. I'm going to go and get that now. And that's why maybe he won't make it all the time, but he'll make it more often than anyone because of just his attitude alone. And so then you, you fast forward to that show and we bowled amazing. We crawled the ladder. We climbed the ladder and we both had a really good look. And then um, the last game I left a four, seven, 10. And what do you think my first thought was? <laughs> exactly what Brian Voss said. Yeah, Brian. it literally was. <laughs> I'm going to make this. I'm making this. And then I made it. And then we won. Yeah. And I always tell the story because, you know, Jason and Michelle bowled so well that um, it was, it was almost unfair that they had to win again. You know how it yeah, is. You sure. can win the tournament, then you have to win the tournament again. And I always, you know, when Jason and I were doing a lot of coaching together, I'd say, and then I just took the $25,000 right out of his pocket and I put it right in mine. <laughs> and I'm sure he loves hearing oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was pregnant. I was like, you got yeah. beat by a pregnant woman on TV. <laughs> How do you feel about that? So I, will, I don't have a lot of things on Jason, but I have that. Not many of us do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I did reach out to Brian. Uh, and he wrote me a long note. He said, okay. how can anyone forget their last victory? This was his final title, his 25th, which Jason has since equaled. Mm -hmm. He said, for me, as well as her, I'm sure, it was a storybook sequence of events. He said, I was way out of the cut with three games to go, but got on a serious roll and shot like 760 the last three to sneak into the finals. She also had a huge last game to sneak into the finals. He said, my siblings, my mother, their kids, their friends, they all live in the Denver area, were all there. He said, so we basically went from being out of the cut with one game to go to both making it and then being paired together. The momentum started with our first game together. We slowly worked our way up to bowling for the show with one game to go. During that last game, I made a crucial 7-10 conversion, which is about as exhilarating as it gets. Then the climb from fifth to victory was unbelievable. Um, he said he was consciously bowling for himself, but also for you and your family. Uh as you said, you were pregnant at the time, and he was aware of that. Mm -hmm. He says, I've watched the entire show many times, and I still cry. Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> Isn't that amazing. amazing? I'm going to cry. <laughs> and she outstruck me. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> but I couldn't have done it without him behind me, because when you have such a great teammate making you feel so comfortable, it's easy to repeat, and you're not worried that you're going to let them down. I, I trusted him so much and he trusted me that he allowed me to be my best. And I have chills, man, you're bringing out all the chills today. <laughs> That's so special. I, I thank you for reaching some, out to him. I told you I had some good stuff for you. Yeah. Too. That's, that's amazing. So in 2012, you end up winning the USBC Queens. And that was one of the, uh, one of the pictures that you, 
uh, sent over to me was you bowling in that, right? Mm -hmm. That's this one? Mm -hmm. Yep. What was that like to win what must have been at the time the premier event for women's bowling? Uh, well, it got me my PWBA title, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. You know, I remember um, going flying to that event and um, I was at a place in my life that didn't feel familiar in that I just had a baby. So Madden was about 14 months old and I was trying to just figure out how to not be mediocre at everything because I wasn't used to being mediocre and I, I was feeling like I was a mediocre mom and a mediocre bowler and a mediocre coach. And nobody ever told me that when you have a family, it's okay if your life changes. Right. So I was still trying, like mentally I was the same person, but you know, we have to stop. We have our bodies change. We have the baby, we have to get it back. And, um, nobody ever said like, it's okay. Like just take your time that's more important. I was still chasing something. And so it was hard because I didn't know where I was supposed to be. And um, I knew I was happy to be a mom, but I, I still wanted to win and I was confused. And so, um, and also on the flight over there, I, I got the idea to start a youth tour and I landed and I called Jason. I was like, we should start a youth tour. And he's like, uh, okay, let's do it. And uh, we both don't know how to start a youth tour. We just knew how to bowl <laughs> tournament, not run them. So that was a significant piece of that story. But I, um, I just remember bowling and qualifying and thinking, you know, just like, just tra stay focused on what I'm actually doing and not what's at home or what I need to tend to. And like Madden's going to be fine. He's, you know, my parents have him, And so, um, at a time where I was very confused and I really wasn't sure which direction I was going to be going, um, I win the biggest title of my career. And I think that was justification and all the justification that I needed to know, I'm going to do this on my terms and I'm not going to feel the pressure. And it was pressure I put on my, there was nobody put pressure on me. It was me. It was like, I was the best in the world at one time and it's okay to not be, and it's okay to not have those dreams anymore. And in a way it didn't feel like it was okay. Like who am I if I'm not that? If I step away from Team USA after these 15 years and people know me as Deandra, as Beatty, Team USA, if I'm not that, then who am I? And so I had this a little bit of an identity problem of like, but then I won and I, I thought I can, I can just do it on my own terms. I don't need to try to be the best in the world anymore. I can compete and I have the support of sponsors and storm and turbo and they're going to love me no matter what. And I don't need to. Well, looks like, uh, well, looks like we may have. Hey, I'm fun. back. You're yeah. back. All right. <laughs> That's if you watch that show at the end, you can see, and I'm not an emotional person, but it was an emotional win. And, okay. and it was because um, I kind of proved to myself that no matter what direction I go, I'm going to be okay. And I, I was so proud to have won that when my grandma was still alive. She passed away um, months later, actually. And um, for her to be able to watch that live and be my first phone call after I won that live major event um, is everything to me. So, um, and then having Madden watch at home with my parents and uh, John be there behind me. Um, I just, I have these visions of like when I, you know, it's like every girl's dream to win their first major against an icon and to have to step up in the 10th and throw two strikes to win. Like you could not have painted 
a better, sweeter picture for me. And um, yeah, it will always, like I, I hope I will always remember the details that I do now forever because um, it's special. And it's not just special because I want a major. It's special because I lost one a couple of years earlier in a really, truly horrific fashion. You know, I, I led the Queens and I like, I was one of the few people that led the Queens and then didn't lose a match. And I was the number one seed on TV and it was my first live TV show and it's different. And I always prided myself on having a good mental game. And I literally made every mistake in the book and that show in my one game that I waited all show for. And I bowled Kelly Kulik and I rushed and I pulled up at the line and I missed spares. And I was, I literally was what you shouldn't do on TV. And then it was over. And then I was watching her put the tiara on her head that I thought I should be getting on mine. And that was the biggest loss of my life. But because of what I learned from that loss, I was able to go on to win bigger. So everybody that is in the midst of, you know, their, their biggest loss or, um, I mean, I remember feeling humiliated and embarrassed and like, oh my God, I can't believe that just happened and I can't redo it. I had to get on a plane and go to right into another tournament, the world ranking tournament. And Jerry Edwards was my coach and she looked at me and she's like, are you okay? And I had tears in my eyes. I'm like, I, I am so much of what you see is what you get person. Like I don't fake my emotions. You always know how I'm feeling. And I was like, I'm just not okay. And I don't even know how to be okay. I just, I can't stop replaying what just happened. It was, um, it was so sad. I was sad. I was mad. I was all the things. And then I started this next tournament in Florida at the world ranking masters. And the first two games were a struggle and they had this huge screen that scrolled the scores. And I was like towards the bottom and I'm like, what is happening? Like, what, who am I right now? And how many people watched that show? And I had all these thoughts and, um, my mom was with me and, and you know, mom, she's just trying to say the right thing. And it was never the right thing. And it was making it worse. And I was like, oh, I don't know how, how am I even going to get through this event? And then, uh, I woke up like three days into the tournament and I just felt different. I was like, I'm going to be okay. I don't know what happened. I think my heart needed some time to heal. I, I really think I was broken hearted and I just needed some time and then I could get focused. And then I ended up winning that event somehow. And the, what I pulled from those moments, I, I will always carry with me because in, in your worst upsets and your worst events, that's the reason that you will succeed. And it's easy to say that to someone else when it's happening, right? It, it, you're not the one that's feeling it. But um, I always tell my youth bowlers that um, if you can take and draw anything positive from the experience and take some time to be introspective and, and allow yourself some space to um, really pull out what went well and what didn't go well and what could have been better, then if you keep building on that, you'll just keep getting better and better and better. And I won the Queens because I lost. And that's just the truth. Yeah. Overcoming adversity is awesome, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just here to say that. Hard. You know, and I, hard. Love, I, I love stories like that because, yeah, there is that hard part that makes you appreciate the good part afterwards yeah. um, mm -hmm. much more. Uh, of course, we know about the Elite Youth Tour. We've talked about that a little bit. You also have uh, a coaching thing where it called Beyond the Lanes. Um, you know, without even saying to Cassie, what about this other stuff? You know, she kind of came at me with, I always knew her ultimate dream was to give back to the sport that has given so much to her and teach others the lessons that you've learned along the way. Hmm. Was that something that was a goal from the start or was that something that as you progress through your career, 
you thought hmm, would be, you know, good to do? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, when I was trying to be the best in the world, I was trying to be the best in the world. And you don't get to be the best in the world. You don't get to be number one um, in anything if if you're worried about other people. Um, and so in, it's hard because I'm such a selfless person that uh, looking back and realizing you have to be selfish. You, you have to, if you want to stand out and you want to be one of the best, you, you do have to have selfish because it is about you, right? And then... Um, Somewhere in my 30s, I thought about all the life's lessons that I learned along the way. And then I was like, it's, I feel, I felt wrong about it at first. And it was like the whole transition of like being a mom, um, scaling back. I felt wrong for like thinking, but what if I can do more for the sport that didn't mean me winning? What if I can have a bigger impact in another way? Because that felt right to me. And I'm very intuitive. And so I started moving towards that direction because I was like, I love competing, but it's different now. It feels different. And I recognize and acknowledge that and that now I know it's okay. And I want to tell others that come after me that your life is going to shift. And, and it's okay to let it because you were one thing. It doesn't mean you always have to be that one thing. And, and that, it, that is, that doesn't define you. And when I realized that in my thirties and I, I really poured my heart into the elite youth tour and I realized other ways that I could give back to the sport, my answer is no, it wasn't the plan because the plan was to be the best. And, and when you are in the midst of it, you're so nearsighted. You're not thinking, you don't even think there's going to be an end. You just think you're going to ride that wave forever. Yeah. Right. Because you are so close to it. It doesn't even dawn on you that one day you, you're, you're not going to win as much. And, uh, and so the significance that I find in the lessons that I learned in my career beyond the lanes, they mean more than any title that I'll, I will have ever won or ever did win. And, um, and I can spread that and I can make people better through that and, and work more in the personal development arena than like, I know I can make people better bowlers, right? I'm a, I'm a good bowler. I've had great coaches. And because of that, I can pass on that knowledge on, on, you know, why I, why a follow through is important and why you should keep your elbow in. But that's, I don't think that's where my power lies. I think my power lies. And I just realized this in the last, you know, at the beginning of last year, before everything shut down, I was trying, I was going through another, like trying to figure out what's next. Like, what do I have to offer? What, uh, what should I be doing? Yeah. And I uncovered this idea of beyond the lanes because most of what I learned that allowed me to become a world champion wasn't what I was learning on the lanes. Yes, it's important to have a good coach and to do the right thing fundamentally and to choose the right ball. But truly, the the lessons that I learned beyond the lanes, the, the personal development, the um, goal setting, the grit, that is the secret sauce to becoming what you want to be. And I want to create a curriculum to be able to put people through that school. And so then everything shut down and I couldn't leave my house. And I was like, wow, this is so weird. Cause as you know, like I'm going so many places right. and I'm doing so many things. And I never had time to develop this idea because I was never in one place. And then all of a sudden I was. And so I put my head down every single day. I made sure my kids were good with their, their remote learning. And I most days didn't even change out of my pajamas. And I wanted to create the best curriculum on uh, personal development. And so I hired a leadership psychologist because I had all of these thoughts in my head 
they just weren't organized and I needed it to flow and to, to like make sense. And so this is something that I like threw together based on, you know, losing or failing. And, and then this is like, this is strategic. And so after working with the psychologist, I um, put together Beyond the Lanes program, which I ran last spring. I'm just like, I'm just going to put this stuff out there because it's, I think it's gold. This is, this is what's going to separate the good from the great. And, um, and I think it's different for our industry because they're not used to focusing on themselves beyond the lanes. And so I think some people are taken back like, well, I mean, I just want to get more 10 pins or I want to strike more. I want my ball to hit harder. And I get all that and, and that's fine. But what are you doing beyond the lanes to set yourself up to become a champion? And in most cases, it's nothing. It's like they're just pouring everything they have on the lanes. And so I created this Beyond the Lanes Academy and I put people through it for six weeks on a Tuesday night. I taught it live and that was the first time that I did it. And since then, I've developed um, Goals Lab and Grit Lab, which is a go at your own pace course for all levels. So let me just tell you a quick story about I, I launched it for the first time in January and Goals Lab is for anyone. And there was a woman who joined. She's a professor of teaching. And I was like. <laughs> a little oh intimidating. <laughs> yes. I was like, oh, my gosh. What is she going to think about how I'm teaching this? So um, she's not a bowler. Her grandfather bowled. She's writing a bowling book. Mm -hmm. I have yet to find out. I, I've been meaning to ask her where she even heard of it. <laughs> but I thought it was very interesting because she went through the course. She gave me really great feedback. And um, she's even come out to an elite youth tour event to meet me, which has been really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, she emailed me not long ago, a really great interview that she did on a, a Chicago um, news radio show. And um, she's a professor of teaching. They were asking her about um, this Dr. Seuss stuff that's been happening in the news. Oh, sure. Yeah. And she, um, she gave a great interview and she said, I just want to send this to you because I wouldn't have done this before Goals Lab. You gave me the confidence in myself to develop my mission and my values and to know in what direction I want to go. And I would have easily turned this down before. And that was the best compliment of all that um, she being a non-bowler is, is really finding out who she is. And I think that is what this is about. The Beyond the Lanes is about reaching inside yourself, slowing down, stopping. I de I've developed so many amazing worksheets that really ask you some hard questions to find out who you really are. And then to have the, the guts to go and be that and to be authentic and to be genuine and, and to not be afraid to reach for those really extreme goals. So I think that kind of like sums up. And now uh, with the PWBA tour, they're, they're allowing me to kind of piggyback on their events. And on Wednesdays before our event starts on Thursday, um, I'm going to be going to the bowling center and opening the um, Beyond the Lanes tour. So my first stop, yes, it's in Egan, Minnesota. I'm so excited to go there. Um, I already have some people that have signed up. I want to keep it small and intimate. I don't want it to be a hundred people. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in going, it's just $75 and it's worth it. Like we're going to do some online things, but a lot of it is going to be some, some reaching into yourself and extracting, you know, you're awesome that you don't even really realize is there. So I hope no matter how old you are or what level of bowling you're at, I hope that you'll consider to join me because it's going to be fun too. You know, it's not going to be like you're going to be sitting and I'm going to be teaching at you. You know, it's going to be interactive and I've never done it before. So it's new to me, but I'm so excited to get it out there. So if you are in the area, I promise that I'll make it worth it if you come. I love it when you answer questions that I haven't even asked yet. That makes it so much easier <laughs> on me. Um, do you think Cassie hit it on the head when uh, she said that most importantly, you believe in developing the whole person, not just on the lanes, but in life? Yeah. And it means so much that she sees it too. You know, she lives in Virginia, so I don't get to see her very much, but it really means a lot that um, that's exactly what it is, right? It's, it's about bringing out your best self and, um, and slowing things down so that you can see it and uh, extract it. 
extract your awesome and and to realize that I'm using bowling as sort of like the medium to to I don't know catapult people to even bigger goals beyond bowling. This isn't just about bowling. I'm just using my experiences through bowling because I was able to to reach a, a high level in uh, in my sport. But um, it's really it's for everyone. And I feel like if we would all put some time and effort into personal development. I think the world would be better. Everybody can work on this stuff. I've I've even gone through it. My husband's gone through it. I've shared my worksheets with him. You know, I I just um, I believe in it so much. I don't know if you can tell. I, oh, I can tell. <laughs> and, and and that's great that you've got a bowler, a competitive bowler in the house to piggyback that stuff off of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Sure. Um. So if you know, you had mentioned, you know. There's spots if you if you're in the area if you want to come out. Uh, what do they need to do to to get signed up? Do they email you? Do they find you on social? It's easy. You just go to beyondthelanes.com forward slash Minnesota. Okay. And if you're in the Lincoln, Nebraska area, I'm doing Lincoln the next week. So beyondthelanes.com forward slash Lincoln. There you go. And that kind of leads into into my next question again. Uh, you know, you said you're not doing this as much. You're not, you know, competing full time. So what does the future have for you? You go to Minnesota, you do the Beyond the Lanes, you compete at, in the Twin Cities Open, and then you go to Lincoln. And, you know, what from there? Do you go to all the tour events? Um, I, I won't bowl all of them. I'll probably bowl half, if not a little more than half. I'm going to go Minnesota, Lincoln, Cleveland, Reno, um, and win another Queens title. And then, um, and then kind of like decide and see how I'm feeling. Like if I want to be at home with my kids, then I'm going to go and do that. I'm actually bringing them with me to Minnesota and to Lincoln, even though they can't come to the bowling center. Mm -hmm. I just thought that to be able to bring them with me, um, to experience it in some capacity is, is really special. And since they're remote learning, why not? Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's good that you mentioned that they don't allow spectators in for the event, but all the coverage is on bowltv.com. So you can see start to finish, really, uh, the Twin Cities Open on Bowl yeah, TV. Yeah, I hope that you'll you'll all cheer me on. Yeah, absolutely. All the good vibes my way. <laughs> We have a, a segment that we call the foundation frame where uh, we invite our viewers to pose questions to you. I don't know if this is so much a question, but uh, Carl is a high school teammate of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he said he, he attended an IAB boot camp and remembers you yelling at him to get closer to the line. Well, maybe not yelling, well, but. That sounds like me. I mean, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll say it nicely a couple of times, but if you're still not doing it, I'll just get a little louder. Okay. Carl, what's up? I remember you. Um, the International Art of Bowling was um, a coaching company that Jason Belmonte, Ron Hoppy, and I started. And um, it was so fun. We created, I think it was like the first online membership to um, do online coaching, which was really called, uh, it was called The Circle, and it was really fun to do. Um, and then it just got to be, it got to be a lot. Jason was too busy being the best bowler in the world and, you know, was at home more often when he wasn't competing. And so, um, it, it was amazing while it lasted. And I'm so happy to cross paths with people like Carl that are yeah. still, still killing it on the lanes. I'm sure hopefully a little closer to the foul line. <laughs> Absolutely. He does. I bowled with him in a tournament. Okay. Maybe a year, year and a half ago, before all the, the shutdown. And, yeah, yeah. And he did very well with it. Hi, Carl. <laughs> and I'm sure he'd appreciate you saying hi to him. <laughs> um, there is one more question I have for you, and it's about a somewhat new social media medium. You are, I believe, the first guest on our show that has a presence on Clubhouse. Yeah, kind I'm, of. Kind of. Hey, there is not a lot of bowling on Clubhouse, um, but if you know people aren't familiar, mm -hmm. it's an audio-only social platform. It's only on iPhone, and you have to be invited to get into it. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, what do you think of Clubhouse, and how do you think it could work with bowling or, or with what you do? Yeah, I think it's amazing. Um, it's just, I only have so many minutes in my day <laughs> and I feel like, okay, I set the Snapchat 
uh, round out. I, I'm not on Snapchat because I'm like, I just don't have time to to keep yeah. up all the social media. And when this came out, um, I love the idea because I really feel like it is another level for networking mm -hmm. and um, just connecting with amazing people outside of our industry that might get them interested in our industry, which I think is um, crucial. My claim to fame on Clubhouse is that I was Jason Belmonte's invite. So he yep. got in because of me. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've been in some rooms that he was in. Um, and I think that there's a lot there's a lot that bowlers can do with it. I just think that we need to get the hang of it and yeah. you know, it's new. Um, I, I like to hang out in like the marketing rooms or uh, personal development rooms. Um, I find inspiration in those ways, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm all about new things. It's just, I get the notifications all day long of like what room I should be in right now. And I almost have this guilt of like, who has time to do all of this? <laughs> I am so busy and I, it's so hard. Cause also we live in a society that like our, our focus is always broken. You know, it's always yeah. like we're doing something and then something else happens. And then we, we move to this and then we, and, and it's hard to get things done that way. So that's my only complaint is just, I wish I didn't have to sleep because then I could be on clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And, and I know what you mean about, about the notifications. There are so many of them. I kind of wait for the one that says bowling or bowlers somewhere in yeah. it. And I try to get it before it ends. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It is interesting that you can't like listen to it later. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's, it's not I wonder recorded, if, at, least, at least not that we know of. Yeah. Right. I wonder if that will be something in the future. Cause it's like, I, have you heard of, um, what's it? Freestyle love Supreme, which no. is, uh, <laughs> no, it, it is. Um, have you seen Hamilton? No, I haven't. Uh, oh, what? I oh know. Goodness. That's I know. number one on your list. Well, I know. It sounds like Prof F. She's always, oh, you got to see Hamilton. Uh, it's so good. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Lin-Manuel's side thing in New York City was this improv, and it's called Freestyle Love Supreme. And Blair from Storm was telling me that she was in a room where they were just improving uh, like songs. And it's just, to me, amazing. You could be that creative on the spot. But that's inspiring to me too. Like those are the rooms I want to hang out with because, or hang out in, because I, I don't, I can just enjoy it. It's like a show, yeah. you know, and I don't necessarily have to partake. I can just kind of sit back and, um, and it's not TV. So it's, there's a lot of really great things about uh, clubhouse. I, I'm sure it will latch on to our industry soon. Yeah. 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 Well, no, hey. I'll have to go and follow you. I was gonna say I'll be I'll be working on uh, helping that along if uh, yes. you know if, if there are bowlers sure. out there who are on Clubhouse come find yeah, me because for sure yeah that's a great uh, you know a great platform to talk bowling. So our our final segment or next to final segment is called Off the Sheet and that's where you challenge another bowler against skill level doesn't matter. Uh, we're looking for people who have a passion for the game and a unique bowling story to tell. So. Deandra Asbady, who would you like to challenge to be on a future episode of Bowling with the Feth? I mean, I could go so many direc different directions. I feel like um, I could go the pro direction, but I think you're going to get pros with no problem. Um, I, I Before I even... Um, you, you're, this is the only thing that you told me about before we started this today. And I had two people in mind right away. And then we talked about them very early on in, in this talk. And my two people that I would like to call out is Cameron Crow and Jillian Martin, because they're the future. And I think we can learn a lot from them. I, um, I think that they're very well-spoken and they have, a lot to give, not only about how to be a, a great bowler or to stand out, but they're just stand up individuals that uh, I want everyone to know. Hmm. That's great. That's high praise. And Cameron, uh, Jillian, if you're watching, come find me, uh, DM me on Facebook or email me at bowlingwiththefeth at yahoo.com. We would love to get you on the schedule. The last thing I want to do 
is talk about our next live stream, which is a week from tonight. Uh, it's April 12th, 6 p.m. Central. And our guest, of course, we can't talk about the Twin Cities Open without getting the defending champion of the Twin Cities Open on the show, right? Fun. <laughs> so uh, we have Shannon O'Keefe next week. We're calling it Defending the Title. And uh, I heard you on a podcast in July of last year talk about Shannon and, and say that knowing that she's actually like a, a little bit crazy and you have to be a little bit crazy to be dominant and not crazy in a bad way, mm -hmm. but crazy, you know, in if you want to understand why she's dominant, it's because she obsesses over the process more than anybody else out there. You floated the name Michael Jordan out there on that podcast. Mm -hmm. Wow. So crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's some similarities there, right? He yeah. he worked harder than anyone and, and she works harder than anyone, not only on the lanes, but off the lanes. And um, and it shows. Yeah, absolutely. Next week, again, uh, we're calling it uh, Defending the Title with Shannon O'Keefe on April 12th, 6 p.m. Central. Deandra, I really appreciate the time and and the conversation best of luck in both beyond the lanes and at the twin cities open and beyond thank you and i'm glad this didn't go any further because it's getting dark and my lighting is getting really <laughs> bad i'm sorry i should have put another light i should have put hey. a light out but it was daylight when we started right <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sorry but uh, thanks for having me and and you know what good job for um for doing this and doing it so well. It definitely feels different than any podcast I've been on. Well, and uh, I've been honored to be on many of them. So just keep doing what you're doing. And any way that I can help spread the word, I'm happy to. Um, uh -huh. I know I had a lot of moments in this talk that, that gave me goosebumps and that doesn't always happen in podcasts. So I appreciate you having me on, especially so early on in what will go down as one of the best podcasts in bowling history. Wow. Man, I'm getting a little misty-eyed here. <laughs> That's incredible. You're doing a great job is what I'm trying to say. Oh, thank you so much. No, that means a ton coming from you. Um, and, and again, best of luck, uh, you know, coming up on, uh, you know, on your future tournaments and, and all your endeavors and all that good stuff. Uh, as we say uh, at the end of every episode, be just and fear not. We'll see you next week. Bye.